Hi guys, just to let you know, I have a promo of another podcast that I would love for you to listen to playing at the end of this episode, so please stay tuned until then. Hi m ms Welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. For years, women have suffered with the innate fear of walking alone in the dark. The darkness provides predators with the opportunity to lurk in the shadows and not be seen by their prey until it's much too late. As women, we are taught not to walk on our own in the dark, to hold a key in between our fingers and learn techniques in order to fight off an attacker. Perhaps, however, it's time that we start teaching men not to attack women to prevent future serial killers. On the evening of the 19th of August 2004, a young girl was found by a passerby badly beaten at Twickenham Green in south-west London, with it later being discovered that she had been struck over the head with a hammer. Police were able to confirm that the girl was 22-year-old French student Amélie de la Grange, who had been living in the UK for three months before her attack. Amélie was in the UK to further her studies, having a real passion for the English language. She had been working at a patisserie, had a close group of friends and also had a boyfriend that lived in the UK. Amélie, who was described by her mother as a good sensible student who was well behaved and never gave her parents any problems, had been out with friends at a French bistro the night she was attacked. Amélie left the bistro at about 9.30pm and got the bus home, but it was later determined by watching CCTV that she had actually missed her stop, causing her to walk across Twickenham Green to get home, which just absolutely breaks my heart because if she hadn't have missed her stop and had gotten off at the correct one she would still be alive now but then saying that we probably would still be sat here talking about a murder it would just be a different girl. Doctors did everything they could to save her but sadly Amélie de la Grange passed away later that night hours after her attack in hospital as a result of her injuries. Police quickly acknowledged that there were definitely similarities between Amélie's murder and a murder that had happened 18 months previous, but they were unwilling to let that steer the direction their investigation went in, so they initially treated them as two separate cases, although they didn't forget about the other case entirely. However, the media linked the cases very quickly and even linked them to another murder that happened two years earlier and this sparked a huge concern to the public that there was a serial killer on the loose in southwest London. Police were also reluctant to link Amelie's murder to the murder that happened in 2003 because they already had a suspect in that case but at the time didn't have enough evidence to arrest him, let alone charge him with anything. The police immediately launched an investigation. They tracked Amelie's phone and found that it actually last pinged on a mast 20 minutes after Amelie was attacked, meaning that whoever attacked her must have taken her phone. From where Amélie was attacked to where her phone last pinged was about seven and a half miles and police determined that the attacker must have been driving. They went to the mast that the phone pinged on and noticed that the River Thames was close by so they had divers search it to see if they could locate the phone and anything else the attacker may have gotten rid of. As expected, divers found Amélie's house keys, purse and CD player. Police also trawled through hours of CCTV footage and this is how they were able to determine that Amélie had missed her stop and why she had to walk back across Twickenham Green. 
They were also able to track her last movements and determined that she entered the green just after 10pm. Knowing the time Amelie was attacked, the time her phone last pinged and the fact that her attacker drove from Twickenham Green to Walton gave police a new lead and sent them down a new path. They needed to check all the CCTV on all the routes available between the two locations, although that wouldn't be an easy task as obviously they still had absolutely no idea what vehicle their suspect was driving. Searching through hours of CCTV was gruelling, but their hard work finally paid off when they found something interesting on one of the cameras. On the 24th of September 2004, police used several external CCTV cameras on buses passing through the area at the time of Amelie's attack and noticed a white van, thought to be a Ford of some description, that was parked some 70 yards away from where she was attacked. The van was first spotted between 10pm and 5 past 10, parked in a bay near Twickenham Green, and then three minutes later, at 8 minutes past 10, the van was no longer there. The van was also spotted on several streets around Twickenham Green up to half an hour before Amelie's attack, suggesting if this was their guy, he may have been scoping out the area. A witness also described seeing a man, around the time of Amelie's attack, hiding behind some cricket screens, which were just feet away from where the van was parked. Police weren't completely sure whether this van was involved in Amelie's attack, but they at least knew they had a witness that they needed to track down. And while they weren't formally linking this case to the murder that happened the previous year, they started looking to see if this white van was in the area on the day the other girl was killed. A statement made to police gave them their first suspect. A woman, Jo Collings, told police that her ex-boyfriend, Levi Belfield, was well known to the South West London area and he had a strong hatred towards women, especially blondes. She also told police how she recalled Levi keeping a knife and balaclava in one of the pockets of his coat and that he was employed as a bouncer and a wheel clamper using a white van for his clamping business. She also told the police that at the time of her statement, Levi was on bail for GBH and that the weapon he'd used in this attack was a hammer. This is an interesting statement for two reasons. We know the suspect was driving a white van and we also know that Amelie was hit over the head with a hammer. So instantly, police start thinking that Levi Belfield may very well be their man. Ford had already told police that the white van they were looking for was made between 1996 and 2000 and police were able to determine that there were 25,000 white vans registered between that time. But once they had information that their potential suspect was a wheel clamper, they were able to cross-reference this information with the information about all the 25,000 white vans registered between 96 and 2000. This cross-referencing gave police one van and one name, Levi Belfield. Whilst investigating Levi Belfield, police found a potential link to another case. On the 28th of May 2004, 18-year-old Katie Sheedy was involved in a deliberate hit and run near an industrial estate in Hounslow. Despite Katie spending weeks in hospital due to her multiple serious injuries, she was lucky enough to survive her ordeal. Now, whilst this isn't the same MO as Amelie's murder, The police linked Katie to Levi Balfield because she was blonde, just like Amelie, and just like his ex-girlfriend had stated that Levi hated 
but also because Katie had just got off a bus when she was hit, again, exactly like Amelie had. Katie suggested a car that may have been used to run her over, some type of people carrier, and police determined that Levi was driving a people carrier at the time of Katie's hit and run, which he sold a week after Katie's attack. Police put surveillance on Levi immediately, but whilst they were investigating him, they also began looking more closely into the murder of the other girl a year earlier. That other girl was Marsha McDonnell. Marsha McDonnell had been murdered on the 4th of February 2003. Marsha was 19 years old and planning a gap year and a trip to Australia at the time of her murder. She had just finished her A-levels and was taking a year out before starting university. Marsha had been working at a gift shop in Surrey whilst on her year off and also had a passion for music, with a music room at a local children's hospice being named after her following her murder. On the evening of Marsha's murder, she had been to the cinema with friends. She had gotten off the bus and was walking to her home that she lived in with her parents, sister and brother. Marsha was struck with a hammer, exactly the same as Amelie was just over a year later. Not only did police begin to believe that Levi Belfield had murdered both Amelie de la Grange and Marsha McDonnell, but they also started to speculate that he was involved in another murder, one that predated Amelie and Marsha. Police began to suspect him of this murder because they found out that not only did Levi live in the same area where the first girl went missing, but he in fact lived just one street away from where she was last seen. More precisely, it would have taken Levi just one minute to walk from his house to where the teen was last seen. Millie Dowler, who was described as being pretty, popular and intelligent, was just 13 years old when her parents reported her missing to police on the 21st of March 2002. It's known that Millie left school just after 3pm that afternoon and walked to a train station in Surrey with one of her friends. The girls got off the train a stop before where Millie was supposed to get off and they went to get something to eat at the station's cafe. We then know that Millie phoned her father at 3.47pm to let him know that she'd be home in about half an hour. So, the girls finished eating and they left the cafe at about five minutes past four where they went their separate ways. Millie walking to her house and her friend walking to hers. The last known sighting of Millie is three minutes later at eight minutes past four, where one of her sister's friends spotted her walking along Station Avenue. A CCTV camera was just down the road from where Millie was last seen, but it never picked her up. What happened between her sister's friends seeing her and the CCTV remained a mystery. Half an hour went by, then an hour, before Millie's parents couldn't take it anymore. Something had happened to their daughter, they just knew, so they reported her missing to the police at 7pm that evening, two and a half hours after Millie was supposed to have arrived home. A huge search started for Millie pretty quickly, with a hundred police officers and helicopters out, searching fields, streets and rivers, anywhere where they thought Millie may have injured herself or fallen whilst walking home. Millie's parents and the police made several appeals for Millie's safe return, and an appeal was put out on Crime Watch, directed at Millie herself. Please come home. You're not in trouble, we just want you back. And this was a plausible theory, 
Even though Millie's mother said she couldn't think of any reason why Millie would want to run away from home, the Independent suggests that sometime before her disappearance, Millie had actually written a leaving home letter and notes proved that maybe Millie wasn't quite as happy as her parents originally believed her to be. It's conceivable at this stage in the investigation that Millie had simply chosen to walk away from her life for whatever reason was distressed enough in her current home situation to just run away. And the police believed this to be a credible theory too. They were adamant that they believed Millie hadn't been taken against her will, that despite the fact that she probably wouldn't have gone with someone willingly, no one witnessed any sort of struggle when she disappeared to suggest that she'd been abducted. Now, the first sign of hope, but probably also realisation and dread for the family, came just over a month after Millie disappeared, when a body was found in the River Thames on the 23rd of April 2002. This immediately caused the media to speculate that this was Millie. However, the following day, it was confirmed that it was actually the body of Maisie Thomas, a 73-year-old woman who had disappeared over a year earlier, and it's believed that there were no suspicious circumstances surrounding her death. But this took Millie's family right back to the beginning, and... I'm sure it also forced them to think, what if the next body is Millie's? Several months went by, along with several searches, but there was still no sign of Millie. Her parents kept sending her texts, refusing to believe that their child wasn't alive. But police didn't share this optimism and hope anymore. As the investigation went on, And as more days, weeks and months went by, the police started to suspect that this investigation wasn't going to end well, that there was a chance they'd be recovering Millie's body and not returning Millie home to her parents. And heartbreakingly, the police were correct. The search for 13-year-old Millie Dowler came to an end on the 18th of September 2002 when remains were found in woods by a mushroom picker in Hampshire, 25 miles away from where she was last seen. The remains were nude and badly decomposed, making it impossible to identify them, but also impossible to determine a cause of death. It was later determined that Millie had been strangled. Naturally, a missing persons case quickly became a homicide investigation, codenamed Operation Ruby. Surrey police began their investigation by looking at Millie's father. However, they later apologised to the family for any opportunities they may have missed whilst looking into him. On the 22nd of November 2002, police set up roadblocks near the location Millie's body was found and interviewed over 6,000 motorists in a hope that they would find some information relating to Millie's death. But unfortunately, all this effort gave police no new leads. The remains were confirmed by dental records to be the remains of Millie Dowler. Nothing new happened for months until the 23rd of March 2003 when male DNA was found on clothing in Millie's bedroom, making police wonder whether she knew her killer. However, three months later, this was ruled out as a possibility, as well as DNA links to a church robbery in Sunderland. As with a lot of cases, There have been people trying to insert themselves into the investigation. I'm never sure if this is for attention or because they have nothing better to do, but I cannot imagine how distressing their actions must be for the families. 
Paul Hughes was jailed for five years for sending letters to Millie's sister, threatening to kill her and claiming to be Millie's killer. These letters were actually sent whilst he was already imprisoned for indecently assaulting a 12-year-old girl, and the prison service apologised for not screening the letters effectively. In April 2003, Leanne Newman was sentenced to five months in prison after pleading guilty to five counts of making phone calls to cause annoyance, inconvenience or needless anxiety after repeatedly phoning Millie's parents, her school and the police pretending to be Millie. On the 19th of October 2006, Gary Farr from Nottingham was sectioned indefinitely under the Mental Health Act as he was considered a serious psychological danger to the public after repeatedly emailing Millie's parents and the police claiming that Millie had been smuggled out of the UK to Poland to work as a prostitute and strippers in nightclubs. This was the last real lead in Millie's case, until Levi Balfield became a person of interest. So let's have a quick look at Levi Balfield before we move on. Levi is of Romany descent and was brought up on a South West London council estate. Levi finished school and college, however quickly fell into a life of crime, with his first conviction being for burglary when he was just 13 years old in 1981. He was later convicted for assaulting a police officer in 1990 and further went on to acquire convictions for theft and driving offences. By 2002, 34-year-old Levi Belfield had racked up nine convictions and spent a total of one year in prison for them. To date, Levi Belfield has fathered 11 children with three different women. Detectives talked to several of Levi's ex-girlfriends and they all described him in the same way. He would be nice at first, even charming, before his demeanour would suddenly change and he'd become evil and controlling. Police were confident that Levi was their man. He lived just a minute's walk from where Millie Dowler was last seen in 2002. He drove a white van, the exact same white van that had been seen just yards from where Amélie de la Grange was murdered. He drove the same type of car that Katie Sheedy reported had run her over in 2004. He grew up in southwest London, which would later become his hunting ground. And Marsha MacDonald was killed in a very similar way to Amelie. All the evidence was pointing to Levi Belfield. Police put surveillance on him and watched as he moved around London and even watched as he attempted to talk to two 15-year-old girls at a bus stop. Luckily, the girls managed to get on a bus before anything could happen to them, but I hate to think how differently things could have turned out if the girls didn't trust their gut instincts and get away from him as soon as they could. DCI Colin Sutton, SIO on the case, said of Levi, When we started dealing with him, he came across as very jokey, like he's your best mate. But he's a cunning individual, violent. He can switch from being nice to being nasty instantly. He has a massive ego to feed. He thinks he's God's gift to everyone. He drives around in his car, feels a bit whatever, and sees some young blonde girl. Young blonde girl says, go away. And he thinks, you dare turn down Levi Belfield, you're worth nothing. And then she gets a whack over the head. It is shown in the case of Katie Sheedy. She was smart enough to think she didn't like the look of his car and crosses the road. He thinks, you think you're so clever and whoosh, he runs her over. Police finally arrested Levi Belfield in the early hours of the 22nd of November 2004 
on suspicion of the murder of Amélie de la Grange. Several days later, he was charged with three counts of rape that took place in Surrey and West London. On the 2nd of March 2006, Levi was re-arrested and this time charged for the murder of Amélie de la Grange, the attempted murder of Katie Sheedy and the attempted murder and causing grievous bodily harm to Irma Dragoshi. Just under three months later, on the 25th of May 2006, Levi was charged with Marsha McDonald's murder. Levi has since been linked to other crimes, namely several murders and unsolved attacks on women dating as far back as 1990, as well as the murder of his childhood girlfriend Patsy Morris in 1980, which would have taken place when he was just 12 years old. Levi has also admitted to other unsolved rape and murder cases, but police have closed these lines of inquiries down, stating they believe he was lying about these admissions. There's also been some suggestions that Levi may be linked to a child sex gang that has never been brought to justice, and also is reported to be linked to six men who were accused of paedophilia, grooming and murder, but police have never been able to confirm these links. Although I must say I don't think I'd put anything past him. Since being in prison, Levi has converted to Islam and has since changed his name to Yusuf Rahim, but no matter what his name, Levi Belfield will always be a narcissistic, evil man and the UK is definitely a safer place with him behind bars. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com Have a great week and I'll see you all next week for another episode. true crime listeners check out our podcast i said god damn we're a true crime comedy podcast hosted by two besties who like to share messed up cases that make you say god damn every sunday we try to one-up each other's story by sharing a horrific case the other has never heard of along the way we splash in some wildly inappropriate jokes and colorful language listen every sunday from any of your favorite podcast directories also follow us on twitter at isgd podcast or visit our website isgdpodcast.com